at you high, the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. We always want to welcome our visitors, whether you're visiting with us here or by way of Facebook or your YouTube channels. This week we celebrate the birthdays of four women associated with members of our church. They celebrate their birthdays on Thursday. Gail Curry on Friday, Emma Baggett and Selka Spann, and on uh, I mean, yeah, and then on Sunday will be Sarah Fox. Regular meetings of the PNC, the Pastor Nominating Committee, and the Renewal Group will be this week. And uh, does anyone have any further announcements that are not on the list? Yes? No? Alright, now let's prepare our hearts for worship and minds as we listen to the prelude, Kevalera, Prospecata, and Give Me Jesus. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
your landlord. You have restored the good fortune of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people and blotted out all their sins. Restore us then, O God, our Savior. Let your anger depart from us. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord, and shall prepare for God a pathway. Amen. Amen.
joy of following in his way. But sin leans closely. Let us seek God's forgiveness so that we may truly know the joy that God intends. Please join me in prayer of confession. God of perfect love, you continually pray for my transforming sadness to joy and despair to hope. We are weak, but you are strong. Our ways are flawed, but your ways are true. We are seldom right, but you are never wrong. Forgive us, redeem us, transform us. Take away the sin that burdens us and restore us to the people you would have us to be. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. God seeks us out. With abundant grace and boundless mercy, God seeks us out. This is good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. This is 
God will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. And now we move over to page 1, 2, 3, 4, 12, 34 in uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. See your heading in the Bible says freedom from human regulations through life with Christ. You can also think of that as being, as we read it, the uh, it's Christ is the superior person, the spiritual being to be in and defeating sin, contrasted to our selves. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in faith as you have taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of the world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised and putting off the sinful nature, not with a circumcision <coughs> done with the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Were you dead in your sins and in this uncircumcision of your sinful nature? God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code and with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. <coughs> and having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The Word of God. Thanks. 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 So by way of introduction, Moses is speaking to the Israelites. They have been led out of Egypt and they have been wandering 40 years in the wilderness. Now they are ready for a second time to go into the promised land. So our scripture this morning begins in the 8th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Numbers, Deuteronomy, chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, the first five verses. Listen now to the word of the Lord. And Moses says, Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised an oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and in feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word it comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. 
is, is that the Word of God, for the people of God, Thanks. be to God. It's an all too familiar scene. In this case, I was talking with a close friend of mine, someone I hadn't seen in a while, and he asked me how I was doing. And I probably didn't mean to sound as negative as I did, but it came out anyway. Well, Dennis, to tell you the truth, it's not going that great. He said, what do you mean? Well, I said, I'm frustrated. I'm discouraged. My energy level is way down. I don't feel like doing much. Certain people have let me down. I have made some mistakes. My problems seem bigger than my ability to handle them. What I'm doing doesn't seem to matter for much. In plain English, Dennis, life is just crummy. Well, he said, you're going through a wilderness period. That's what I just told you. Life is no stinking fun right now. No, 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 he said. Not, not wilderness like life is crummy and that's it. Wilderness like God takes people to the wilderness sometimes. A spiritual wilderness. It's in the Bible. You're the preacher. Check it out. Well, this guy is somebody who two years before didn't know diddly squat about Jesus. Wasn't even a Christian. Got saved in my Sunday school class and now he's telling me what's what. But you know... I took my friend's words as a word from God. <clears throat> You're in a wilderness period. Check it out. So I did check it out. I checked out what the Bible teaches about the wilderness. It began to, to change the way I looked at things. And I said, you know, if I'm in a wilderness, then I need to learn about it. So I began to pray and ask God, teach me what it means to be in a wilderness. I began to look in the Bible and study that concept. I began to ask God, what is the wilderness? How do we wind up there? What lessons are we supposed to learn there? And how can we learn them and get out as quickly as we can? Some of the things I learned there really did change the way I think about the Christian life and how I feel about the Christian life. And I want to share some of those things with you. It is not often that I get the privilege of preaching two Sundays in a row. So I don't ever get to do a series. And I love series. Two, three part series. This month has five Sundays, so guess what? I get two back to back. So this is a two-part series. Today we're going to look at the wilderness and how we get there, how we end up there. And next Sunday I'm going to tell you how we get out of the wilderness after we've been in it for a while. So I hope we'll come back next Sunday when we talk about it. Once I started studying the wilderness in the Bible, I was amazed at how prevalent it is on the pages of Scripture. I found it is mentioned over 300 times in the Bible. Showed up at some of the most crucial moments in the Bible. For example, if salvation history begins with the travels of Abraham, it's done through a wilderness. As you go along, you see that it plays a part in the calling of Moses. And then in the exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt and into the promised land. The training of David for kingship. Predictions of the Old Testament prophets. And even the temptation of Jesus himself. And the wilderness plays a part in the final prophecies of the book of Revelation. Now. We find that the wilderness plays a crucial role in some of the Bible's most important moments. But from my study, I discovered that the wilderness will play a crucial role at some of the most important moments of our lives as well. 
So this morning I want to get into this topic of the wilderness by asking and trying to answer very quickly four questions. What? Who? When? And why? In that order. What? Who? When? And why? So first question. What is the wilderness? For the Israelites, it was a real, literal place. It was a place they knew firsthand. It was a place much different than what we normally think of. You know, when we think about going off to the wilderness, we think of loading up the Suburban or the Explorer, putting on the hiking boots, getting the tent out, putting on the sunshade, you know, a great little getaway. We think about running streams and forested valleys, wildlife everywhere. The great Northwest, the big thicket, mountains of Colorado. Nothing could be further from what the Bible means when it discusses the wilderness. The Hebrew word that is translated as wilderness, Yashimon, Yashimon, literally means the devastation. That's why sometimes you find it translated in the Bible as the desert. It was a place of baked sand and limestone, sharp rocks everywhere on the ground. No vegetation. The air is dry. Rainfall doesn't happen. You never find water running. The only sign of movement as you look as far as the eye can see is the heat radiating up off the hot, barren, jagged sand. That was the physical meaning of the wilderness they were familiar with. Now, as with other terms in the Bible, there was also a symbolic meaning, a deeper meaning. And what I discovered as I read through the Bible is that the wilderness was symbolically a place or time for trial and struggle. It was a place or time when God tested and Satan tempted. It was a place or a time when a soul stood in the harshest of environments all alone, able to hear nothing except the blowing wind beating of its own heart. Not certain if it would return to life better and stronger or broken and beaten. So, what is the wilderness? It's a time when your soul is dry and parched, where it feels like you are alone and where you struggle and where you're tested. But catch this, it's also the place where God can mature you and grow you and develop you and strengthen you more than he can in any other place or any other time in your life. Now, number two, who can expect to enter the wilderness? Well, as far as I can tell, the biblical answer is everyone. Every one of God's children. Which is just a polite way of saying you will and I will. You will one day find yourself, if not many times, wandering in the wilderness where your heart is dry and your soul is parched and you feel God on one hand testing you to be better and Satan on the other hand tempting you to be worse. You feel yourself pulled in many directions not knowing which way to go, but knowing that what you decide will return you to life better and stronger or weaker and defeated. Now, we can enter the wilderness all kinds of ways and the Bible gives us several. We can enter the wilderness by our own actions, through our own mistakes, and our own wrong decisions. That's how it was for the people of Israel. You remember that God brought them to the border of the promised land and said, this is for you, this is my land of blessing for you. All you have to do is go in, I'll defeat the enemies before you, and you will live in abundance. But the Israelites did what? Remember? They looked at the people living there and they began to talk among themselves. And they said there were too many. They were too big. 
They're like giants. And we're like grasshoppers. So they fell into a spirit of disbelief and they disobeyed God and they just refused to go forward. So it was at that point that God just turned them around, sent them back into the wilderness, where for 40 years in this most desperate of climates and places, they had to learn over and over again that God could be trusted and that God would provide for them. That he would fight their battles. So sometimes that's honestly how we end up in a wilderness, through our own mistakes and wrong decisions. Maybe it's a moral mistake. Maybe it's a mistake in our business or our marriage or how we deal with an old hurt. We get into bitterness and anger and our soul begins to dry up inside. Maybe it's the way we deal with pressure and stress. We turn to a drink or drugs. And all of a sudden we're lost in the wilderness where our soul is parched and dry and wondering where God is. So sometimes it's through our own doing that we end up in the wilderness. But not always. Sometimes we enter into a wilderness through the action of others. That's how it was with the prophet Elijah. You remember the story? Elijah had this great spiritual victory. He defeated the prophets of Baal. And Jezebel, this idolatrous, evil queen who worshipped Baal, swore to put Elijah to death and sent her armies after him. So he runs away into the wilderness to escape her anger and what the Bible tells us is there in the wilderness this spirit of depression came over him. And he even prayed to God just take me now. Let me die. I've had enough. And that, that's how it works for us sometimes, isn't it? The action of others that create a wilderness experience for us. Maybe it's the death of a loved one <coughs> not meant to hurt you. Or the attack of an enemy or the betrayal of a friend. Someone we thought we could count on and who would be there for us and then turned right around and stabbed us in, in the back. And what we found out was that instead of believing the best about us, other people believed the worst and began to pass that around. Sometimes, because of the action of others, that we find ourselves undergoing a wilderness experience. And then sometimes it's because of the action of others that we find ourselves undergoing a wilderness experience, but it's also the natural flow of life. Life itself brings us there. That's the way it was with Moses. Moses made a mistake while he was in Pharaoh's court, ran out to hide and protect himself. But I don't think he ever would have spent any length of time in the wilderness except for a natural progression of events. He met a woman, he fell in love, he married her. Her father brought him into the family business, which just happened to be raising sheep in the wilderness. So it was just a natural flow of life. Be a woman, marry, be brought into the family business, given an opportunity, and for 40 years Moses is in the wilderness until God speaks to him through the burning bush. So for us, sometimes, we find ourselves in situations that life just kind of throws at us we move from teenage years into young adulthood and from young adulthood to our middle years and into our senior years and it just seems that in those transitions we have to wrestle again with the question, who am I? Who am I going to be and where am I in this stage of my life? And what am I going to do with these longings, these yearnings that I still have or did I have anew? be very difficult and lonely time. And here's what 
I want you to listen to me very carefully about it. Because it can easily be misplaced. Sometimes we are brought into the wilderness through the plan of God. God takes us there Himself. Sometimes we are brought into this difficult period of testing or trial because it's part of God's plan for us. Now that's difficult to hear, but I want you to hear it. It doesn't really play well in the midst of pop American theology. We have this idea that's taught all over that God's main job is running the universe <coughs> and to make sure that my life goes well. I mean, that's really what God is mainly concerned about. At least that's what I think he needs to be. He needs to remove all my problems around me. He needs to make sure that my territory is expanding. Needs to make certain that everything is going well for me and for those I love. That's how I know I'm in God's will. That's how I know that God is blessing me. Here's the truth. Sometimes God doesn't want to expand our territory. Sometimes God wants to change your territory. Sometimes he wants to put you in the midst of a wilderness experience so you can grow in ways that you would never grow when things are good and the living is easy and your life is expanding. Sometimes it's God's will for you to be led into a wilderness and if that's hard to believe, just think about Job. The devil came to God and said, sure he loves you. You have given him everything his heart desires. You have made it easy for him. Take some of that away and see how he relates to you. So God let any of the things Job loved be taken away. How about Simon Peter? Jesus, the night before his death, calls Peter over. Talks to him about how he's going to deny him three times and that the devil is going to sift him and the others like wheat. In Luke 22, he does not say, Simon, guess what? The devil wants to attack you and tempt you and test you, but I'm not going to let him do that. I got your back. Don't worry. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, Peter, get ready. You're fixing to go through a very difficult time. Peter, remember this. I'm going to go through it with you. I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to be there with you because I believe you can handle it. And when you come out on the other side of it, Peter, I've got plans for you. Jesus didn't try to keep Peter from the wilderness. He let him go into it. Prime example is the father with his own son, Jesus. Jesus was led by the Spirit into what? The wilderness. To be what? Tempted by the devil. Who led Jesus into the wilderness? The Spirit. God led Jesus there to be tested, to be tried, to be proven. When can we expect to enter a wilderness period? I'll just tell you, anytime. Sometimes it can happen when we've been unfaithful. That's how Israel was. Sometimes it can happen when we are doing everything right. That's how it was with Jesus. Jesus had done everything right. He had just been baptized and he winds up in the wilderness. It can happen when we are at a spiritual low in our life. That's what happened with Moses. If he killed the Egyptian and had to flee, he probably thought to himself, I've messed it up now. I was supposed to be in Pharaoh's court for a reason. Now I gotta go. Thanks to my anger. I really messed it up this time. You can enter the wilderness when you're on a spiritual high. That was Elijah. 
There's probably no greater spiritual high portrayed in the Bible other than the resurrection of Jesus than what Elijah did at Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. So, it can happen in your highest moments. It can happen in your lowest moments. It can happen when you're being faithful to God. It can happen when you are doing everything right. It seems like, truth is, you can enter the wilderness at any time. And by the why? Why does God allow His children to go through a wilderness experience, and even more so, why does He sometimes lead them there Himself? The reason is because He uses the wilderness experience to prepare His people. There are times when we have to go through testing and temptation and struggle if our character is going to be developed, if strength is going to be produced in us. There are two ways that God prepares us for this. First, He prepares us for blessing. God wants to bless your life. God blesses you abundantly. Jesus taught one of the great truths that God loves you like a loving father loves his children. God wants to bless you and bless me, but you need to be prepared before you receive the blessing or that blessing can become a curse. Think about it. Athletes, politicians, celebrities, people that you know who have been blessed and blessed abundantly have everything, either materially, reputationally, Financially, professionally, but they don't have the character to keep it. And they lose it. We often say that sometimes people will fall in a blaze of glory because they've been blessed before they have the character to be blessed and not be cursed in the process. Think about entertainment, admiration, adulation, opportunities to influence people, talents that you and I just dream of. I can think of a list this long, easy, of entertainers and sports figures and other well-known people who have been blessed and been anointed even by the Holy Spirit for ministry and, and, and other great things for God but didn't have the character to bear the blessing. So God prepares us to learn and be satisfied with what He provides so we don't wind up worshiping idols that will lead us to destruction. And then finally, another reason God takes us to the wilderness is not just to prepare us for blessing, but prepare us for battle. When God tells the Israelites, I'm going to give you abundance, He also tells them, you're going to fight some battles, and you're going to need everything you learn from me in the wilderness, how to follow me, how to obey me, how to fight battles along the way. And I can tell you that God is fighting a great battle in history right now. And it doesn't matter whether you're thinking politically, financially, internationally, ecclesiastically with the church. The battle is to bring light and life and salvation to people in this world that is so dark and divided and desolate. We have to be prepared. We have to learn how to fight. And that's what the wilderness God will take you to the wilderness. God will allow you to wind up in the wilderness sometime. To teach us, to teach you, to teach me how to depend on Him. How to trust Him for what we need for provision and protection. How to prepare us for blessing and for battle. So that when we come out of the wilderness next Sunday, we will be stronger better prepared, more disciplined, and most likely more obedient. 
than when we entered the wilderness today. And I hope you'll join me next time. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
scripture says it is right and it is meat in e e t that when we gather together we lift each other up with our burdens and celebrate with each other in our joys so i have added don boggs to the list this morning he's changed some medication he's not feeling well so don others that you may have
said that this morning, thinking, and I would ask you to this week of those times before you felt like you were in any kind of volunteer work or ministry or in a vocation or even in retirement where you were doing things and being loved to others. There was a time when you were tested, you were tried, you were proven and made ready for the work that you were about. Now receive the benediction that as you go forth, May God the Father and Jesus the Son and in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, may the perfect and holy Trinity go with you, guide you, guard you, protect you, and teach you, and prepare you every day of your life. Amen. Grant, O oh Lord, we pray that the words we have said and sung this day may find favor in thy sight, that thy truth may be grafted in our hearts. So that our 